Hey, what is up, mortals? It is EsperkVA here with a new video for you. Welcome to part 16 in season 3 of What If Deku Had a Regen Quirk. I just wanted to greet you guys by saying sit back and relax. You're in for a treat. And so, we begin. So here's the situation. Midoriya is currently at the summer training camp and had gotten overwhelmed, so he hid in the bathroom. While hiding in the back room, he may have accidentally punched his reflection in the mirror, so that's not good. And what's also not good is the fact that Mandalay's nephew is now staring at the mess that is Izuka Midoriya on full display. Did I miss anything? No. Okay, let's go. Midoriya wanted to say something, but he had no idea where to start. He could start with, Hey, nice to meet you! I'm Midoriya! Or a, sorry for the mess, it was an accident. Midoriya's jumbled brain attempted to formulate a sentence, so he ended up saying, Hey, sorry to meet you, I'm a mess and an accident. Wait. Koda looked absolutely disgusted. Midoriya has truly hit a new low. Things surely couldn't get worse from here. Midoriya stood up and tried to approach the kid, but he tripped and fell face first into the broken glass and tile floor. Koda's jaw fell open. Midoriya just accepted his fate and laid there. As a pool of blood formed around his head, Koda rushed to Midoriya's side and started shaking him. His panic voice cried out, Hey, mister, wake up, don't die! Midoriya slowly stood up and wiped the glass off of his face. Koda's usually hardened expression was now one of relief. He must have noticed the face he was making, as the small smile was quickly reduced to a neutral frown. Midoriya then panicked as he realized Koda's hand was bleeding. He grabbed a handful of paper towels and he did his best to treat the wound. He would use his regenerative blood to help, but it was probably for the best to not freak this kid out even further. Midoriya was wrapping his hand with the paper towels when Koda asked, Are you okay? Midoriya laughed nervously. Uh, yeah, don't, don't worry about me. I have a regeneration quirk. I, sh I should be asking if you're okay. Koda replied, Yeah, I'm fine. But I meant with your emotions. I came in after hearing glass breaking and saw you crying. Midoriya shifted his weight with growing nervousness. Well, it's just some adult and hero stuff. Don't worry about it, though. Enjoy your childhood. Please. Koda was surprisingly sympathetic. I don't really like hero stuff either. The kid had a look in his eye that Midoriya knew all too well. Grief, anger, confusion. Something bad must have happened to him for him to be feeling all these emotions at such a young age. Midoriya tried his best to comfort him. You don't have to tell me what's going on, but know that it's okay to reach out and get help if you need it. Koda had some serious walls set up. He looked at the hero students with a bitter disdain earlier, and now Midoriya knew that it was the fact that they were aspiring heroes. He knew that he was Mandalay's nephew after she briefly explained it earlier, but maybe there was more to it. Carefully, Midoriya approached the subject. Did something happen with heroes when you were younger? Koda restrained his tears, and his next words were spoken hesitantly. Uh, Mom and Dad were heroes. Midoriya's heart skipped a beat. His parents had likely passed in the line of duty. It made sense now. He was so young and didn't understand why society revolved around heroes, villains, and quirks. He was probably just so confused about it all. He directed that anger and sadness at the hero society which had taken his parents away from him. Unfortunately, Midoriya understood how he felt. I know what it's like to lose a parent, too. My dad was killed by a villain when I was a bit younger than you are now, but I know how confusing it is. Why is society separated into groups of heroes and villains? Why are people killing each other over confusing matters? Koda looked up at Midoriya as he listened intently. The two had a lot more in common than he originally expected. I could have grown to hate the heroes who failed to save my dad. I could have grown to hate hero society. But there was someone who helped me through that part of my life. All Might. Seeing him saving people with a smile inspired me to become a hero myself. I wanted to be a hero who saves lives and prevents someone else from experiencing the grief I felt. My hero name is Ultimatum, because I want to be a force that leads people, including villains, down a better path. If they don't, then I'll do everything in my power to create positive change for them. Midoriya realized that he was rambling, and Koda stopped crying and was looking at him with an unreadable expression. Uh, sorry for rambling. Uh, have you eaten yet? We should probably head back to the dining hall. The doors to the bathhouse suddenly burst open as the Class 1A boys, now re-energized from the meal, boisterously prepared to head to the hot spring. They stopped in their tracks, however, and Kirishima exclaimed, Whoa, dude, what happened in here? A mirror was shattered with glass and blood decorating the floor. 
What didn't help was that Kodo was teary-eyed with a handful of bloody tissues in his hands. Midoriya could play this off. Koda had an accident while cleaning the bathhouse for us. I came in to use the bathroom and saw that he cut his hand on the glass. I was about to bring him to Mandalay right now. Koda gave Midoriya an unimpressed look, but Midoriya grabbed more tissues and held them against the kid's hand. Kirishima looked unconvinced and replied, All right, but then wh wh why is there blood on your face, though? Midoriya could actually tell the truth for this part. I fell face first into the glass on accident. Bakugo let out a huh! in the background, but the rest of the class looked mildly concerned about Midoriya's clumsiness. Having successfully convinced Kirishima, Midoriya escorted Koda out of the bathhouse and into Mandalay's room. She thanked Midoriya for helping him and then brought him in to treat his wound properly. Midoriya took an apple from the dining room to eat before returning to the bathhouse. At least having something in his system would be better than nothing. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. With the services Skillshare provides, you can get access to many in-depth tutorial videos on basically anything you want to learn. Each class that they have is bound to help you with your creative endeavors. Do you want to learn how to make videos like this one? Do you want to learn how to write scripts or edit audio? Skillshare has you covered, and with our link, you can have a 14-day free trial. So what are you waiting for? Click the link now and get 14 days worth of classes free. Link in the description below. The next day came faster than Midoriya expected. All his body wanted was more sleep. His stomach growled, clearly upset with last night's excuse of a meal, but breakfast was more than enough to satiate the hunger. Class 1A was collectively sore and tired, and Midoriya was glad to be numb to muscle soreness. He was still dead tired, though. Aizawa began explaining to the class that they would be receiving quirk training that was specifically crafted to strengthen each student's quirk. As he began explaining what each student was tasked with doing all day, dread began to creep up on Midoriya. Was Aizawa a teacher or a certified executioner? Some of the ideas he had were straight-up torture methods. Bakugo had to plunge his hands into boiling water to extend his sweat glands. Jiro had to stab her earphone jacks into the mountainside. Koda and Shinsou had to scream their lungs out all day. After each student received their task, it was just Midoriya and Aizawa left. The teacher spoke. I saw that you updated your quirk registry information to note that you also have partial immortality. I wanted to ask you about it. There was no way Aizawa was insane enough to be thinking what Midoriya thought he was thinking. Midoriya tried to run away, but Aizawa's capture scarf prevented him from moving another step. Midoriya spoke fearfully. Yes, it's true. And just like that, Midoriya and Aizawa were now standing at the top of a mountain. The drop-off was steep, meaning that if he fell from here, he'd be reduced to a bloody pile. Seeing Midoriya's hesitation, Aizawa spoke. You have one of the most powerful quirks in your class. Maybe even the world. The ability to come back from death, regenerating almost instantaneously, being numb to pain. I also heard some rumors that you can kill and heal others with that blood of yours. You'll be an invaluable asset on the battlefield. Midoriya laughed as the wind softly pushed against his back. Thanks, Mr. Aizawa, but compliments are not going to convince me to jump off a cliff. Aizawa sighed. Well, as your teacher, I can't force you to jump. I want you to know that once you overcome your natural fear of death, you'll be unstoppable. You already go into fights with a recklessness that would put a normal person's life in danger, but you're assured by the fact that you regenerate. This is the same thing, but with death. You need to be able to take a bullet for your allies with the confidence to know you'll come back each time. Midoriya pondered for a moment. He kicked a rock and watched it fall to its doom. Seeing the rock be reduced to a million pieces was not very reassuring. Midoriya knew that Aizawa was right, but every survival instinct in his body was screaming, Hell no. Plus, Midoriya had no idea how long it would take for him to regenerate after being completely obliterated by gravity and rocks. He would be okay with starting small, like letting Aizawa snap his neck or something, but they had to skip right to the big guns. When his legs got chopped off, it took about a week for them to come back. Several months had passed since then, and Midoriya had lost his limbs more time at UA than he ever had in his lifetime. That must have been good training, as regeneration worked a lot faster now. Maybe after being temporarily boosted by one for all, there were some lingering effects as well. Coming back from multiple stab wounds to the brain only took only a couple of minutes, but that was only brain damage, not full body decimation. He'd only died once, maybe twice in his life, which is more than most people, but he wasn't exactly an expert. Midoriya took a while to think, and he came to his final decision. He turned around and proudly announced to Aizawa, Yeah, there's no way in hell I'm jumping off of this cliff! Aizawa shrugged. He had alternate training for Midoriya anyway. So it wasn't like the cliff jumping was the only option. Midoriya stepped away from the ledge, but the ground beneath him shifted suddenly. Part of the ledge crumbled, and a ripple effect pulled more ground out from underneath Midoriya's feet. The teen reached out to hand to grab something, anything, to save himself, but there was nothing but falling dirt. 
Midoriya felt his back collide with the ground, and the next moment he was back in a mortal brain land. That was extremely embarrassing. Now he had two options. He could go to his future self and get some more cryptic messages about the future, or come back to life. And no offense to future Midoriya, but present Midoriya's not a big fan. He closed his eyes and tried to find a light in the darkness. It was dark for a long time, and Midoriya was starting to become worried about how long it was taking, but then a small gray spark quelled his fears. The light grew brighter and Midoriya chased it. He embraced it and felt warmth return to his body as his eyes jolted awake. Midoriya shot up and saw how the sun was now in a very different position in the sky than it previously was. He then looked below him and saw how there was a relatively large splatter of dried blood all around him. Good thing he was separated from the rest of the Hero Course students. Having his classmates see him die would be traumatizing. He rubbed the back of his head and dirt fell out of his hair. He stood up and his body felt normal and unchanged. He wasn't sure how much damage he sustained from falling from such a height, but his body felt completely fine, as usual. After trekking up the mountain, he saw Aizawa curled up in his signature yellow sleeping bag underneath the shade of a tree. The hero had honed his senses as once Midoriya approached, he yawned and stepped out of his sleeping bag. The Eraser Hero handed Midoriya's phone back to him, and the teen was presently surprised that he was only dead for about three hours. Aizawa also set up a time-lapse camera at the bottom of the mountain to record the regeneration process, and Midoriya was too curious to not want to watch it. He immediately regretted it. It was graphic. Really graphic. Like dropping a water balloon and watching the water burst out of the plastic covering. Now replace water with blood and guts and plastic covering with skin. Yeah. Wonderful. Midoriya handed Aizawa his phone again as he walked up to the ledge. He didn't feel like having his phone smashed to smithereens. Midoriya was still terrified and his instincts were telling him to preserve his life. With a breath to build confidence, Midoriya jumped off the cliff again. Slowly but surely, over the next two days, Midoriya was shortening his time spent while dead as his body learned to regenerate faster. He was also gradually suppressing his natural survival instinct. Despite having only two days pass, Midoriya had shortened his time down to around 30 minutes. This wasn't a very good time, as his entire team could be wiped out and killed in half an hour, but it was progress nonetheless. Midoriya was ready to take another leap, but Aizawa stopped him. Look, I'm glad that you're excited to jump to your death and all, considering that that was the point of the exercise, but it's time for the test of courage. Midoriya followed his teacher down the mountain and met up with the rest of his classmates. The Test of Courage was a game that the Pussycats created to help students use their quirks more creatively in a fun way. The students cheered, but unfortunately, five Class 1A students, one Class 1B student, and Shinso were taken away for their remedial courses. Midoriya was about to draw his lot for teams when his phone started to vibrate in his pocket. When he saw the name plastered on his screen, he almost dropped his phone in anticipation. It was Melissa, which meant she found out what was on the villain's SIM card. Thank you all for indulging yourselves in all this information thus far. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, there are a few more things that I'd like to go over before the video ends. Firstly, I'd like to thank our patrons. BD Flames, Ethan Davis, Terry Chills, Shifter Meals, Adam Zagel, Zill, XAVB03, and Joshua Phelps. Secondly, I'd also like to thank all of our YouTube members. Toei Acosta, Rob the King, Sith Lord 906, CF2364, and Knuckles, Rimuo Tempest, Angel Juarez, Donald C. Stewart, Bryant Greer, and Demonized Fox. Thirdly, if you're on the moon for some great storytelling, We the Celestials has you covered. Our We the Celestials, My Hero Academia, and Naruto What If channels retell the story of their namesake anime with a twist. Check it out if you're interested. Fourthly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details can be found in the description below. Lastly, if you're interested in what we do here at We the Celestials, I'd like to extend an invitation to join the team. The only caveat is that we only accept members from 16 years old and up to join our crew. You can sign up for whichever category fulfills your interests by joining the recruitment discord using the link in the description below. We're always looking for members to join us. Well, that's it from us for today's video. So thank you all for watching, and have a great day.